Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Real Talk Podcast, where we just talk about issues in life and faith, just anything really that's kind of current and relevant and that we want to talk about. And we think today's topic is pretty relevant. Uh, we're talking about politics, and uh, this is like the this is like the <laughs> it's the clickbait one. You know that we're going to get oh, more clicks man. on this one than any of our other Real yep, Talk podcasts because yep. people are just so interested in this and we're coming at it from a slightly different perspective and the title of today's episode is Politics <clears throat> is a Pit. So mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that a little bit and uh, it's been a crazy season and so yeah. I just want you to reflect just a little bit right now in the middle of COVID 2020 election season. What is going on? So, you know, one of the things, man, we have talked about this a lot. And I know we say that a lot, but I have proof. If you can go back, there's a podcast somewhere on the internet called the White Oak Podcast or something like that. Uh, we talked about this literally two years ago. We talked about outrage culture. We talked about politics and how divisive it was and all that kind of stuff. And so... Um, these are not just off the cuff. Like I, I hate people like just like want to speak off the cuff all the time because it's like, are you going to really support that when the emotion washes away? And so yeah. I think right now a lot of people are reacting that way. And I think it's good to come from a convictional place and a big picture place. Um, and that's why I like where you start with that question, because you, you're saying what's happening right now. Like we're, we're trying to get above the chaos and really assess what's happening and I took a step back and I was thinking, man, man, what is happening? And I have a few things I'm thinking right now. Um, I think one is you can't, you can never understate how um, the internet has changed things. And so the internet, there's uh, people are seeing things, fake news spreads, biased news spreads. It's almost like the internet just like exports um, and exponentially grows everything, including bad things. And so political divide is going to increase because of the internet, because everything seems to multiply on the internet. Um, it gets darker, more people hear about it. And so I think the internet is just kind of like multiplying everything. I think another thing that's happening that a lot of people don't realize, right, um, is I think both political parties are changing and they really don't like each other and what the other is becoming. And so let me give you some examples just really quick. Um, because people, they, they, they hear old names, they think of what they thought of Republican or Democrat was in the 90s or whatever, because that's what their parents told them. But like the, the parties are really changing. And so an example would be for a long time, I know like the, the right or the Republicans were known as the party of family values, right? And, and there, there's probably a lot of ways in which that's still the case. But think about it, like Donald Trump is the leader of that party now, right? Yeah. And, and once again, I, I respect him as our president. Um, you know, I don't agree with everything he does or everything he says. And so I don't want to um, disparage him. I want to be really clear or careful not to do that, even though I clearly disagree with a Are lot of things. Donald Trump no, I'm not. No, I'm not endorsing any candidate. Um, but like, I don't think it takes a, you know, a, a really intelligent person to realize that, you know, you're the party of family values and all that kind of stuff. And Donald Trump is your leader now. Like, okay, yeah. something's shifting. There's, there's a different direction it's going in the direction of. I think the liberals for a long time, the Democratic Party was seen, at least when I was coming up, as the party of like tolerance and diversity. And now it's kind of like seems very intolerant, you know, and, and in some ways not even very diverse in terms of the thought. Like there's not really a willingness to engage in diverse thought. Yeah. It's like this is the way. And if, if you don't agree with that, then you're like, you know, the worst person in the world or, or you hate everybody or whatever. I think also what's happening there's just radically different worldviews. And, and so once again, I'm not going to speak in this super deeply, but like, I think when you, when you uh, think about conservatives, they tend to think that America is generally a good place, you know, and, and even the problems America has had in the past, they would say that was kind of a global thing, you know, like there were a lot of countries that participated in all these things, you know, women weren't respected, you know, in a lot of countries 200 years ago, you know, but um, it's not just an American kind of thing that, yeah. that, you know, they don't necessarily blame America specifically for a lot of those oppressive kinds of things. Whereas the more liberal side will often say America is just in generally an oppressive place. And so one side's trying to change a bunch of stuff, which some change is good. Um, one side's trying to kind of preserve everything, you know, um, and it's almost just like this radical clash and people are not on the same page. And then the last thing that I will add is there's a lot of pride on on both sides a lot yeah. of pride um there's not a lot of objective thinking it's like if you are on one side it's like if you're a fan of donald trump if you're a republican or whatever or or, or you like donald trump any bad news about trump is fake news you know and any good news about trump is the truth you know yeah. and if you're on the liberal side um, anything good about biden is the truth anything bad about biden is fake news that's being spun by somebody 
And so it's almost like for whatever reason, there, there's a lack of objectivity on assessing things and people literally just kind of see their sides as infallible, meaning incapable of making a mistake. And so radically different worldviews, radically changing parties, multiplied on the internet, and then just kind of an unwillingness to really kind of um, maybe kind of compromise out of just a clear sense that we're a very different, like there's different people in America, so we're gonna have to compromise, you know, to some degree. Um, all that's happening and it's blowing up. And I, last thing I'll say too also is I think both parties have, are right about each other, you know, but both are saying right things. And usually what I've noticed is where there's major conflict, both people kind of have a point. So yeah. what do you think, man? What, what, what's happening as you're looking at this man? Like, I know we're just kind of off the cup, but what, what are you seeing right now? Yeah. Um, I agree with everything you were talking about. Um, just for me, I, I see a few things. One is I, I think most people are getting their information now via like social media. Um, mm. and I think that can be good in the sense that there's a, it's like a democratic forum where like all information can be out there on the table, but I think it could be a bad thing in which it's all unfiltered as well. I think people think they're going to get like more of the truth on social media, but in fact, Ooh. you're getting more bias because the people who are posting are always adding their commentary on whatever's happening. And so I just think that as people get more information, uh, less from traditional news sources and more just from online that it does kind of create more bias and maybe creates more misinformation. Like there's a lot, mm. there is a lot of fake news that happens on both sides on social media. And it's very mm -hmm. easy. M maybe most of us have been victim to maybe like sharing an article that ended up too not quick. being true. Yeah. yeah. Just too, too quick. It didn't end up being true. And so that's number one. Uh, I think number two is, um, I think the political parties have become, the twin gods of America, yes. like the Democratic and Republican Party, which everyone that Savior. you identify with um, can almost do no wrong. And like you were saying, you, you hear an article about your candidate or you hear something about them. And, you know, if it's a bad thing, then it's fake. If it's a good thing, then then it's to be celebrated. Whereas if the other side does the exact same thing, you, you're not willing to celebrate that. So I just feel like people have become so identified uh, with partisan politics, honestly, that it's impossible for us to to make those bridges until we're willing to admit that there probably is both good and bad on either side. And then the last thing I'll say, I just, I think there's a lot of anger and frustration yeah. with our generation because, you know, I mean, we haven't really suffered through like a world war, but a lot of bad has happened. There have mm -hmm. been financial crisis, recessions, housing blow up, um, Afghanistan, and Iraq. I just felt like this, this generation has gone through a lot um, that has angered it. And so you're seeing that happening right now as people have very little margin and there's just a lot of anger about um, the direction of the country. What's really interesting, this last thing I'll say is like, yeah, I, I go to Real Clear Politics, which is kind of like, a, they do a lot of polls and they do poll of polls and stuff like that. And it's funny how like, you look at the percentage of people who think the country is on the wrong track and like, both sides agree <laughs> that it's going on the wrong track. So I wonder which which track are we going down if everyone <laughs> thinks it's a bad track, it's steering the ship, you know? Um, so I just think all those Satan. things- Satan. Yeah, like, like, so all those things come together, I think, to create this like melting pot of like just, I don't know, a cauldron of something that's just, just blowing up right now. Man, you said something that was really good. Um, I, I, you, you were talking about how like it's become our God. And I, and I think in some ways, um, when you think of like um, America and just culture in general, there's always different like divisions of like power and authority and how we see the world. And I think like in America for a long time, regardless of how engaged people were with the church, there was a sense of like, you know, there's go there's like the, the, the government of America, but then also we believe in like a higher power and we're engaged with that. Mm -hmm. And so there's almost like this division of like what's happening in the world, who's to blame, how do we understand this? And I think a lot of just like spiritual apathy has come over our nation and that category is gone. And so it's almost like we've got these like big picture kind of divine questions and problems that we're wrestling with. And since we don't have spiritual answers, mm. we're blaming, we're going to blame somebody the same way. Everybody worships something. Yeah. Everybody ultimately worships something. If it's not God, it can be yourself. It can be sin. It can be another person. It can be a circumstance of life. Like we all worship something. And so it's like the world has always been broken, right? At least since the fall in Genesis three, the world's always been broken. And before we had this sense that like Christ was making things new, let's obey him, let's be a part of that solution. Um, but when that goes out of the way, when, when the savior is no longer Jesus in our eyes, it often becomes a political figure. Yeah. Our, like, like a lot of people think the savior of America, maybe even the world is like the, what the Democratic Party stands for, what the Republican Party stands for. And so there's almost like this like savior kind of void, a king kind of void. And I think like you're saying, I think politics is filling that void, yeah. but it can't fill that void. It just creates more division. We don't believe in Satan. So now we think our opponent is Satan. Yeah. You know, we, we don't have a concept for these big things. And I think people are turning on each other. Yeah. 
I just reminded of like, you know, they talk about if you make your spouse like your God, you're going to crush them with the weight of yeah. your expectations. And the same is happening with a very broken political system. Like we're, we all know that we're like, we're sinful. Like people in Washington are sinful also. And so we're putting our hope in yeah. very sinful, broken people. And it's just creating. <laughs> and there's just no humility, man. It's like, I, I, I have a new thing where like, I feel like I, I've got to always make sure that I'm talking about my bad things and things, I, the mistakes I make and the way, places I fail. Cause like, I just get tired when someone else talks about somebody else's fails, like so self-righteous as if they've never failed, yeah. you know, we all fail, you know? And so we should be mindful of that when we talk about other people and I'm just like, good guys, bad guys, you know, it's like, it's not that simple. It's a good call. All right. So let's think about ourselves. <laughs> so politics is a pit summed up. Uh, let's think about ourselves <laughs> a little bit and just like, man, uh, we're followers of Jesus. Let's assume that we want to be engaged in some way, or let's just assume like we, we want to do it right, man. How should a Christian navigate into the minefield that is <clears throat> U.S. politics and government and all those kind of things? I think we have to think biblically. And so, you know, I always go back to Romans chapter 13, where Paul makes it clear. Um, and this was important for him because he was writing to a church in Rome. They had a strong government. Mm -hmm. And there would have maybe been a potential to say, like, government is all bad. And, you know, you know, it's Jesus over Caesar, which obviously is true, you know. But it was kind of interesting. He talks about how, like, government is actually instituted by God, you know. Um, and, and though the leaders might be failures in a lot of ways, since we're all failures, um, the idea, the concept of like an earthly government is God's institution and idea. And God wants order in a society, he doesn't want chaos. He wants order, he wants rules, he wants laws and all that kind of stuff. And so I think we approach it by saying, okay, so the, um, the, the thing itself is good. Government and order is, is good. Um, I think the main thing then is to really say, okay, then how do we engage? And so if government is good, and if the way our government is set up is we vote and we participate, then you can say, well, it is a good thing to participate. So it's a good thing to vote. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good thing to be informed. It's a good thing to uh, participate in the process. Um, but I guess I would just say that, so we want to participate, but we, we want to be mindful. That's why we call this politics as a pit of the pits along the way, because we're engaging in a flawed system. The same way, like you imagine, like you, you go to like a house like, like that's being built and it's not finished being built yet, you're kind of mindful because you don't want to fall through the floor, you know, Good like you, you, it's like, it's like broken down. It's like, it's like, you know, um, you know, like my car right now is breaking down. So I'm a little more mindful of like, you know, I don't want to get on the highway, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so like w w you're entering into a flawed system. And so just be careful of, of the pits. And so I think one is just to make sure that like, we know that like, government's a good thing. We should participate, but also we should bring all of our convictions in terms of like, we should always be loving, you know, what does it look like to love your enemies? Even your, I think that includes political enemies too. Yeah. Uh, we should be mindful of not losing our hope or our joy. Um, and, and I think lastly, we should think through biblically um, our convictions and like the candidates that we're voting for, we need to research them because most people that are watching this, um, they really just believe in caricatures. They never actually research it for themselves. What do they believe? Uh, what are the implications of these policies? Um, is it good? Does it help create uh, to some degree more of the world that God wants us to have? And, and to, to make an informed decision on who we vote for based upon those different things, all the while loving people, all the while praying for our leaders and doing those good things. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about this, and this is obviously, this has to be one of those areas in which you have to seek the Lord and come to a personal conviction of how involved you're going to be and make sure that you don't err into sin. There's nothing in the Bible that says specifically, you you know, you got to vote or do this or that. Mm -hmm. It's just not in there. And so we have to kind of come to a, a biblical understanding ourselves through prayer and looking at the scripture of how involved we're going to be, mm -hmm. uh, knowing our own limits and our own brokenness and, and how involved can we be without being in sin. But I do want to mm -hmm. bring up uh, I don't know if anyone's ever like thought about it from this perspective. I'm sure people have, maybe you haven't just like thinking about what does the Bible say in terms of like civic engagement, obviously a very different context. Like you're talking about they're in a Roman empire at which there is no voting. You do not vote for Caesar in a Roman empire, um, but it still talks a little bit in the new Testament about it. And so I just had a couple of verses. One was obviously Romans 13, where it says like, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority except that which God has established. Mm. And then first Timothy chapter two says, I urge you therefore, first of all, that petition and prayers be made for all people, for kings and those in authority, and that we may live peaceful and quiet lives and godliness and holiness. And so just using those two passages right there, um, a rubric, a biblical rubric for civic engagement is number one, pray for your leaders. Number two, obey them. And then number three, 
live a, a respectable life in which outsiders see you and are drawn to be more like Jesus. Man. Do you think that's a rubric right now for the way that people are engaging in political elections? Yeah, well, well no, because, and you make a great point, like, like for all of us, let's ask the question, have we really gone to the Bible? Because once again, we, you know, the Real Talk podcast is not just John James giving our opinions on stuff. Like, even though we have opinions, like the, the word of God is what Christians believe is, is our ultimate authority and truth because it's the book that God wrote, right? And it's true. And if you've lived by, you've experienced its goodness, you know? And so have we actually gone to the Bible and, and read what it says about what we should do? For, for a lot of us, it's probably no. Um, and so what that means is we're probably acting um, either emotionally or ignorantly based upon what some other flawed human that doesn't know everything tells us we should do, you know? Yeah. And so, but, but, but really quick, what you just said, I love that. How would you sum that up again? So if you're like, oh, James, what, what does the Bible say? Like, cause, cause the Bible doesn't speak on something like, like when the Bible says, how do we engage with this? Like, just really simply, what does it say? I mean, it says to, I mean, it says to pray. Prayer is your primary engagement, probably even above like voting. So we're praying. So okay. Like we're praying. Um, and I think what you said, like we're, we're thinking about a biblical worldview and we're looking at issues and candidates and, and we're, we're judging the best that we can with the information that we have, who is leading us more toward a biblical worldview. And then number three is probably we're just doing it peacefully because it says do it like respectfully. And so I, I'm just that's reminded. It. Yeah, there you go. That, 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 that's it, you know, but, but, it's all, but, but it's all like the, but here's the thing. The problem is all of the extra stuff, you know, uh, that we're doing. And so from your perspective, what are the signs that we've crossed into that area? Okay, because sometimes it's not obvious because if it was, we wouldn't do it, right? So we're supposed to be like you said, we're supposed to be like aware that God creates government, praying for our leaders, engaging from a biblical worldview, loving one another in all things. People obviously do a lot more than that. So from your perspective, like what are signs that we've kind of crossed that line? What's all the unnecessary jank, if you will, that, that is creating all the chaos? Because it's not God's ways that are creating chaos. It's, this is not happening because people are being too prayerful for the leaders. This is not happening because people are being too loving and forgiving and non-retaliatory, right? Yeah. This is happening because of other things. So what do you think are the things that are happening beyond that? Like what's creating the problem? I just know, I mean, obviously there's the heart issue underneath, just the fear, especially as like believers in Jesus, the fact that we're like attributing kingship to a, a broken political system is number one. But beyond that, just some like signs that you may be delving past engagement into obsession is probably like when you're sharing articles like on the internet. A uh, lot. Yeah, you're sharing a lot of articles on the internet and, and commenting on that. Or you're the, you're the person who's always like, did, did you hear what Trump did? You know, you're that guy who's bringing that up all the time. Um, maybe another sign of a heart issue is like when you see a political sign of an opposing party and it, it just brings out that kind of like rage in you. I thought you were going like to say that. you go take it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah. You're a sign Way stealer. Too far if that's happened. Um, but, you know, there, there's a quote. I forgot who said it, but he said that we, we, we judge others by their worst actions and we judge ourselves by our best intentions. And I think that's just a good reminder, kind of like what you were saying earlier that, you know, as we think about maybe our own party or, or another person's party, that's good to remember uh, the good and bad in both and not always just see the bad in the other and the good in yours, but to remember that, um, you know, everyone provides perspective and everyone um, has something good to say, honestly. I think a few things that you've kind of crossed the line, because speaking of you, you gave us a great list right there. So what are the other things? Um, arguing, you know, um, in the Bible, it says to have a, a reasonable response for the hope that is within you. And yeah. so, and, and we see Paul, like in Acts, he would go to the temple and he would literally like argue persuasively for the gospel. I don't see anywhere in scripture where we're arguing over politics. And some Christians might disagree because they'll say, whoa, whoa, but I'm arguing for good things. But the answer is you're arguing for those things from a biblical, for, maybe from a biblical worldview with someone that doesn't have a biblical worldview. Yeah. And so it's one thing to, to talk to someone about like the gospel and faith, but you're, you're, you don't get why they don't get it, but it's because they're, maybe they're, they're not saved, you know? And so, you know, so, but, so if, the, if the reason is like they don't care about this issue because they don't love God, well, shouldn't you talk to them about God first? Like, shouldn't you share the gospel? And so I think a lot of people are, are convinced that somehow they're going to force a biblical worldview on people that don't have a biblical worldview. And, and listen, you don't get a biblical worldview without the gospel because it's the spirit of God in us that does the work. It's not our persuasive argument. And so if anything, it's almost like people, 
they're like, we don't have time to share the gospel or, 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 or to, you know, grow the church because we got to handle political things. But it's like you're trying to change opinions of people that will never have their opinion changed. Yeah. I think another one is you lose hope and joy. I think that if politics has the ability to make you feel like all is lost, like doom and gloom, um, like if you are going to be beside yourself because a political candidate, a certain one doesn't get elected, um, I say this humbly because we are all subject to this. Um, you are way into way too into politics, you know, and, and, and if your hope is that a, pol a flawed political figure, um, I would just kindly encourage you to like repent of that repent, you know, and uh, repent to God for placing your faith in, in a man. I mean, the Bible is full of all these characters, especially in the Old Testament, even these great leaders that God appointed and people put too much hope and trust in them and they all let him down in the end, right? Yeah. It doesn't end well for, in a lot of ways for, you know, Moses, it doesn't end well for a lot of like the prophets, you know, um, David makes a lot of mistakes. And so I think that, you know, just learning to, to realize, oh God, maybe I have put too much faith in this and it's stealing my joy and just saying, God, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to you. I mean, think about it. Christianity grew in the midst of the Roman empire. Yeah. It was way worse than here, you know, no matter who gets elected, you know, uh, the last thing I'll just say, I, I just want to read this passage just because I feel like God has always put this one on my heart. In second Timothy, Paul is writing to like a young pastor. I just want you to hear these words right here. He says this, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. Timothy, you know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. And so, not, number one, not only are we avoiding arguments, but also in the ways in which we genuinely are right, that maybe somebody's in the wrong or holds the wrong position or wants the wrong thing, the Bible says that we patiently endure evil, and God might deliver or whatever, um, but we're always patiently doing it. I'm always reminded that a fruit of the Spirit is, is uh, patience. Yeah. It's not impatience. And sometimes, you know, um, you know, God might be wanting to, to do something in the next four years, um, you know, through a pruning process, you know, and so, but in all things, we're always trusting the Lord. It's a good word. Um, you know, I was just thinking as you were talking how, like, I think a lot of people who are really engaged in politics, like they're there because they care, like they're yeah. passionate. It's yeah. coming out of a place of like, I really care about this country. I care about people or maybe this specific group of people. And so, you know, I, I can understand like what drives people to those places and, and maybe it, it starts out good, but it comes to a point to where it's unhealthy for us and the people around us. And I'm saying that as someone who, you know, not a lot of people know I, I, I studied political science yeah. in college and, you know a lot and about thought it. that that was something I wanted to do <laughs> and, and finally realized that this is a very broken system. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to put my time and energy in another place. And so let's talk about that a little bit. Like for people who may have crossed the line to where they're just so focused and obsessed, like how how do we take a step back and maybe where do we redirect like energy and, and focus to instead of those places? You know, we've always talked about living local. And I think especially with the internet now, it's more important than ever. And the reality is, is for all of us, God has put so many opportunities for really good, effective work right in front of us mm -hmm. each and every day. Um, and maybe part of it is maybe we don't trust God with the big picture. And so we think we have to try to enter into the big picture and change everything. Yeah. And yet the, the reality is, is, is God oversees the grand arc of history and it's going towards a good end. It really is, you know, it's gonna be some trials, but it's going in a good direction, rest assured. I think so often, like you said, we, we overlook the people right in front of us. And so I think uh, some good examples of that are number one, um, man, make sure you're healthy, make sure you're walking with the Lord and loving him. Um, love your closest family and friends. I mean, walk yeah. with them, love them, serve them. I mean, just a point blank question. Like, you know, if I, you know, go to one of my, my spouse or my kids or my friend or whoever I live with or whatever, and, and I just encourage them and build them up and pray for them. Is, is that a better use of my time maybe than like posting about politics or, you know, getting an internet squabble, you know, like, like, you know, which one, what slinging mud in the comments Yeah. Yeah. Section. Yeah. All, all the people you're convinced them to change their minds, which is zero people you're changing, you know, like, like, like it's almost like I'm about to say, man, man, if you're engaged in it, your marriage better be like amazing. Your kids better be thriving. You know, you're, you must be, you better be crushing it at work, you know? 
And I think maybe for a lot of people, we talk about this, it's a lot of hypothetical stuff. And so sometimes it's easier to engage in like, it's like, it's like we, we, we don't even know our neighbor and we're trying to change the cultural tide, you know? And it's like, Hey buddy, let's start, start, you know, get your, like, love your neighbor, you know, love your spouse, you know? And so I think for all of us, it's just a humbling thing where it's like, I feel like the internet's like, Oh, I can make a big difference, you know? Um, but you maybe make no difference, you know, because you're, you're not really like, like, there's like levels of influence. And so I think it's investing in your family. I think another one's your church. Yeah. I think, you know, like you want to change hearts. Like this is how you do it with the gospel. The church is a place where we work individually and collectively to spread the hope of Jesus. And, and the greatest way in the long run that we will affect that change is by changed hearts. And I think the problem we're seeing right now is in America, we've changed laws. We haven't changed hearts. And so you can change laws on, on racial things, but until you change hearts, the problem will, does not go away, right? And so you can, you can make racism illegal by the law, but, it, but, but, but changing a law doesn't change a heart, you know? And, and it is the gospel, like Ephesians 2, that breaks down those walls of hostility. It is the gospel, Ephesians 4, that makes us like loving and tenderhearted to people. It's Galatians uh, chapter 6 that makes us bear one another burdens, whether you're white, black, Hispanic, whatever you are. And so it's almost like getting to like that spiritual root of things and not assuming that the policies are going to change people. And so I think it's loving real people in your real life. And, and listen, if God wants to promote your level of influence, if he wants to promote you, he will do that. If he wants to give you a big platform, if he wants to make you a political figure, make you an activist, like he will do that. We don't have to force that in this world yeah. because ultimately we trust God with the grand arc of, of, of history and of where things are going. And I guess the last thing I would just say is I think, I think helping to create peace in the chaos is the big one too. I think um, this is a time for peace and for unity, not division. And so if there's a fire, hey, put it out, you know? And so I think that this is a time where as, as Christians, we have to realize that, um, you know, one of the fruits of the spirit is, is peace, you know, and not division. And so I think that, you know, we say we want to enact all these policies to bring the, the kingdom, but if we're creating more division, we're not bringing the kingdom, right? And so sometimes the kingdom is the thing before the thing, and what if the thing before the, maybe the right policies was peace, right? Um, like, like maybe if we were people of peace, maybe God would bless our efforts more, you know? Mm -hmm. If it's really God that blesses efforts, um, I have a pretty strong conviction that probably he would bless peace and love and compassion uh, more than arguments and arrogance and uh, thinking less of other people. Yeah. Yeah, those are really good points. Um, for me, uh, just something I would encourage you with um, to redirect some of that energy is just going back to like praying about these things. Uh, there's a psalm, and I forget which one it is. I think it's Psalm 46, but don't quote me on that, where it says that basically uh, the psalmist where it says he looks around at the world at all the injustice, yeah. and it's just anger in his heart, which I think a lot of people can sympathize yeah. with, just anger as you look around, no matter which side you're on, you can just, you see the injustice, it's so visible right now. Um, and in the Psalm, it says that he was angry until he went to the house of the Lord, and then he discerned um, from a from really a gospel-centered worldview, from like God's worldview, and it brought him peace. And so, man, you, it, it's almost like, <laughs> it's dangerous for your soul to engage in the political process without prayer. It's really dangerous to yeah, do that. There's no good end. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're doing that. And then uh, number two, like you are saying, just like remembering that um, God ultimately is in control no matter who gets elected. It, it does yeah. not change the fate of the universe, which is sealed like on the cross, like in Jesus. And, and Peter tells us that we're born again to a living hope. And so if we don't have hope, then essentially we're, we're acting as though we're spiritually dead. Yeah. When you think about um, <clears throat> the future, you know, um, what do you think are, when you look out the next, say, say you know, <laughs> say God intervenes, which we're praying he will, and the church, because once again, like like the the world's gonna world, you know, but like like that's the, awesome. The we world's gonna like, like yeah, it's gonna be chaotic. It's gonna be like politics are always gonna be divided. You know, it's always two parties, and they don't like each other, and that's always been the case. And you know, it's like oh, it's new now. It's not new. It's always been this way. You know, I mean, like man, people. I mean, people, candidates have been assassinated. That stuff happens. You know, but if the church is a bright light over the next ten years what do you think it will look like? Like if this is our moment to shine, what do you think practically that looks like for Christians who like want the church? Because what if, 
what if the win in this is not the right political party, but like that the gospel shines bright? What does the church look like over the next 10 years to, to be that contrast? Yeah. Um, gosh, that's, that's interesting to think about. The two things that I come up with is just like, number one, I think in the same way that the church has the power to transcend the brokenness of the world when it comes to like racism, when it comes to immorality, whatever it is, like the, the church has the power to do that. It's the only hope of the world to overcome these very systematic issues. And so number one, I just, I, I see a church that's unified and through its unity under the banner of Jesus is transcending yes. some of the issues that the world is trying to fix from secular um, means and methods and the mm. church on the other hand, is actually overcoming these things and transcending these things because it has the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I just see yeah. a unified church under the banner of Jesus that is embodying what everyone else in the secular world wants but can't find. And then number two is I just hope more and more that we identify ourselves primarily as like human humans and followers of Jesus and less with the political party. It's fine to vote for parties, but yeah. I just hope that the church just, just gets out of bed with and it just ejects from just especially the political party system, not government, but just like the political parties, I think are very toxic for our culture. And so I see a day in which we, we vote, but we don't necessarily identify with a party as a whole because we identify with Jesus. Yeah, I agree, man. I, I think that we're hopefully a, a non-anxious presence too. Yeah. I think that's a big thing. I think that we, um, man, right now, if you can just not be an anxious person, like people will want to be around you. And, you know, we always joke about like, you know, we want to live where people are like, what is the hope within you? What makes right. you different? Like, I mean, the next 10 years, like there's a lot more potential for that. This whole secular modernism and secular thinking, there's always like, oh, we're progressing and we're going to, we're going to outthink all of humanity's problems. And then we hit a pit like this and it's like, we, you know, go back 50 years or whatever it feels like. And it just can't work, you know? And so the, the world is anxious again, but the hope in that is that we could not be the anxious people because Jesus literally said, do not fear. He said, don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it, you know? And so like, I think to just like maintain our own personal peace, a phrase I've been using a lot is protect your peace. Yeah. Protect your peace, right? So that you can be a witness. I think another thing is, I think like you said, to be involved in good, healthy ways. Oh, you want to give me a vote? Like, I'll, I'll vote, you know, I'll inform myself and I'll vote. Um, and like you said, also, man, I think willing to be different, willing to be unique and willing to not be labeled by, by two different parties. Like I, I really pray that we, we become like in a red and blue world, we're a purple people who, um, have biblical convictions about things and, and we're not trying to fit it within one political party, but we're like this like prophetic minority. It's like, guys, you're missing it. There's something more, there's something better. There's a greater hope and his name is Jesus because like in the Roman empire, that's what they were doing, man. It's like, there's this powerful empire and they weren't trying to overturn the empire, you know, like they, they, they didn't believe they even could, you know? And so they were just like loving the Lord, proclaiming the gospel, loving people, and it's amazing that like whenever we humble ourselves, repent of our own sin, love our own neighbors, like God always historically has this means of, of, um, of intervening and we should expect that we're not going to see it. It's going to be unexpected because God does that. So he gets the glory, you know? And so it's learning to be wise and to be involved, but, but not under the illusion that we're going to elect the right person or we're going to put the right policies in place that are going to make everything better because we don't have the means to. And so our solutions will always fail. Yeah. And yet God is the one who sovereignly does these things. The Bible says God loves to save his people. He loves to save us. He loves to empower us. In John 15, he, he, Jesus literally says, like, I, I want you as my disciples to produce much fruit I, so, so you can prove to be my disciples. Yeah. But he says that we do that by abiding in him. And, and so as, as Christians, it's almost like we've got to advocate strongly for, for our convictions and for love, but also trust that whatever the solution is, it, it, it will not ultimately come through politics. And, and honestly, it won't even come in ways in which we're expecting it because God is going to do it his way. And the Bible says in Isaiah 55, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so we rest our hope in that. That's a good word. Uh, just my final encouragement would just be like, to look for the kingdom yeah. uh, in the midst of like the politics. Uh, I think it's very, all that's bad is very obvious and it will always be obvious and it screams for our attention. But the kingdom is interesting when you look at the New Testament, the kingdom of God, 
um, can be right in front of you without you even realizing it. And so like, as we look for the kingdom in our life through like the fact that we have like community happening in our church and that we have like good things happening. So you're looking for where is God working as opposed to just looking at the problems of the world, I think is, is probably really good for your mental health in the season. And then on November, um, when's election day or whatever, the, the day after, third, whatever it is. Like yeah. No, November 3rd, um, and just recognizing that no matter what the outcome is, that, uh, Jesus is King and he's still in control. What about you, man? Any final thoughts for them? Yeah. And we talk about this a lot just in general. Um, I would say you do not have to absorb other people's anxiety. Um, you have a choice. And right now I'm experiencing this a lot, I guess, cause I'm a pastor and people want to talk to me about a lot of different things. Um, and they want to know my perspective. I, I talk to some people and I can feel myself getting more anxious and worried because I'm talking to yep. them and hearing their negative, like, it's like, it's like, the, like maybe they're really scared and, and we have a natural instinct as humans to, um, kind of want to absorb other people's fear. Like we're getting data about the world and while they're telling me it's really bad. So I, I, I probably need to know that. And the reality is there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of confusion. There's really a lack of faith right now. And I think it's just being mindful of that, that just because one person, um, keeps talking doom and gloom or just cause that one person keeps like sharing the worst, most negative, depressing articles on the internet or on Facebook or whatever. Um, unfollow that person if they're teachable, you know, and, and they will, you know, trust in the Lord or, or, or they'll be, they'll repent of, you know, you know, honestly not displaying their faith, not being a light, but being darkness in the world, then, then maybe that's a good thing. And I would talk to them, but if they're just going to kind of go off on their own, like I would say, protect your peace, right? Because that's how we're a witness to the world. But also remember that you can be around those people and you can be like, man, like, I know it's crazy, but like, it's going to be okay. Like you can say that, you know, and it's not disrespectful to that person. If anything, it's like it maybe gives them a chance to believe that like, well, maybe it's not all bad or whatever. Yeah. So I just think really remembering that just because somebody else is anxious, just because some news organization is anxious and just because some politician is saying very worrisome things, it does not mean that we have to adopt that and that we don't have to absorb that. Uh, we can be people of peace and love and joy. The future is bright. The best truly is yet to come. And I really think in the future, maybe the greatest apologetic for the faith um, is going to be joy and positivity because that's really what demonstrates our hope in these times. It's going to be okay. God has us no matter who gets elected. Um, no matter who gets elected, we know our calling, which is to spread hope with joy. It's a good word, encouraging word for us in this season. Thank you so much for sharing. And you thank too, you man. so much for watching. And uh, remember, as you go forth, just protect your peace most of all. And uh, we hope to see you next time.